The scripture reading this morning comes from the letter to the Colossians, chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. Put to death, therefore, whatever in you is earthly, fornication, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming on those who are disobedient. These are the ways you also once followed when you were living that life. But now you must get rid of all such things, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive language from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have clothed yourselves with the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge according to the image of its creator. In that renewal, there is no longer Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free, but Christ is all and in all. The word of God for the people of God. Good morning again, church. We are making our way through this uh, season of Lent, taking the six weeks or so before Easter to delve deep into the soul work that prepares us to really celebrate Easter well. And so for Lent this year, we're focused on the spiritual work of resisting racism, really stepping back as a, a predominantly white congregation and listening and looking for the ways that we really do participate in racism, even unknowingly and unintentionally, acknowledging that, the, that changing that really is spiritual work, it's soul work. So we're asking ourselves, what are those spiritual actions, the, the movements that we do in order to um, be active in pushing against racism or becoming anti-racist? On Ash Wednesday, we talked about choosing as an action, how as um, particularly for white people, we have to choose to do this work, to take on this type of, of fast that isn't just about us individually, but rather something that connects our, our spiritual work with the work of justice. Then last week, we, talked to, uh, we took a look at Psalm 51, and we talked about the action of asking, asking God to come in and find the places within us that need cleaning up, the sinful parts of ourselves that we aren't even aware of that we avoid looking at. So for the first week and a half, we've been talking about choosing and asking. These are both actions that are about receptivity, kind of preparing our hearts to do the hard work. It's like a warm-up for the workout of Lent, right? Doing real spiritual work of any kind on any subject, it takes some time first to, to stop and to check ourselves, to see how we are approaching that how we're approaching God, whether it's with an attitude of, um, well, this doesn't really apply to me. I am a good person. I have enough of the, I don't know everything, but I've got enough of it figured out. This is not really about me. Or we come with a posture of humility that is ready to see things we haven't seen, to hear things differently. So today we really begin to get into the meat of the work by talking about naming. Naming is the act of uh, assigning a word that we use to identify something. Basically, it's calling a thing a thing, right? The name that we give to things is important. Our practice of naming, it's important. B back in the book of Genesis, in one of the creation stories, God gives Adam the job of naming the creatures. It's a partner job. God creates the thing, and then Adam gives it a name. Cow, giraffe, um, lion, platypus, right? Adam gets to be this co-creator, partner with God through the act of naming. The writer Laman Sana, he notes that, um, that naming is this creative act. He says that, that naming lies at the center of healing and wholeness. 
With naming, we remember, recollect, respond, act, and celebrate. Without it, without naming, we invoke the chaos of Genesis, the chaos before the creation was, came to be, before it was named. Naming is part of what brings life and dignity to the creation. So in our passage today from Colossians, this, um, the author of this letter is describing this newness that is meant to occur when we step into life as a follower of Christ. And he was talking to um, this community, he was writing to this community of people who had gone very clearly from point A to point B, who one day did not follow Jesus, did not even know who Jesus was or anything about him, and then to a whole life change of becoming devoted followers of Jesus and his way. So they went from here to here pretty rapidly. That shift came quickly, and when that happens so fast, it really puts uh, the change, the before and the after, into stark relief, doesn't it? Compared to those of us who maybe have just grown up in the church and sort of slowly slid into following Christ, this was a clear departure from one thing, you used to do this, and now you need to do this instead. Things changed for them dramatically. And one of those changes, one of those marks of change that is expected when following Christ is this. It's in verse 9. Do not lie to one another anymore. That's what the people of God do. They stop lying to one another. They start telling the truth. It seems simple enough, doesn't it? And yet, we know better. Naming, naming is about telling the truth when it's hard. When it would be easier to, to stay silent, to simply avoid the topic altogether. Naming is the act of identifying and speaking the truth. When it comes to racism, naming is recognizing that our usual excuses for our own actions and for the actions of others, those excuses need to be laid down and acknowledged as lies so that we can better see what's true. Racism, it goes by a thousand names. It wears a thousand different disguises I'm still working through Layla Saad's book called Me and White Supremacy, and as she writes this book, as I'm reading it, I keep noticing how often she has to really identify for us just what she's talking about when she says white supremacy. She knows how prone we are to say, well, that's not racism, that's just choosing the most qualified person for the job. Or to say, well, he, he was just making a joke. He really didn't mean any harm, right? One of you told uh, me a story last week about an experience of helping your young adult daughter in a move. And when the movers arrived, two gentlemen uh, came in the door and you approached the one who was the young white man and shook his hand, addressing him as though he was the one in charge, making that assumption, rather than the older black man who was actually the leader of the team. And then, a few minutes later, when your daughter came into the room, she made the exact same mistake. How easy it is to chalk that up to an honest mistake but the practice of naming calls us to tell the truth. This is racism. Leila Saad writes, yes, outwardly racist systems of oppression like chattel slavery and apartheid and racial discrimination in employment have been made illegal. But the subtle and overt 
discrimination, marginalization, abuse, and killing of people of color in white-dominated communities continues even today because white supremacy continues to be the dominant paradigm under which white societies operate. So we must call a thing a thing. We must call a thing a thing even when it is hard, even when we would rather stay silent. Part of what our faith does, what grace does with us, is enable us to see clearly, to clearly see and to say the truth. The truth is, we make excuses and we misidentify racism often. And we usually do it, I think, for two really big spiritual reasons. The first reason is because we feel shame and regret for the past, for the ways that we might have done harm to somebody else. We worry that our past, that those things that we've done are unredeemable. That if we call those actions that we did racist, then that means that something about us also might be unredeemable. And we would rather cover that up than to face it. And the second reason why we make those excuses and misidentify racism is because we fear or we even despair for the future. We wonder if racism is this deep, if it's so deep in us that we don't even notice it, and we thought we were the good ones, if all of that is true, is there any hope for the future? Is there any possibility that this can be overcome? Will we be stuck in this individual and collective brokenness forever? Is there a way out? Two reasons. Shame for the past, fear and despair for the future. So that's where we circle back to Colossians. This passage needs to have a spoiler alert on it for Easter, right? It kind of gives away the end of the story because it's all about what happens when we take up new life in Christ. It talks about putting it on like a cloak through the power of God that defeats all evil, we are freed from the shame about the past. Jesus offers forgiveness. And then through that same power, we are freed from fear about the future because Jesus has secured eternal life for all. So with that freedom from shame about the past and freedom from fear about the future, then we are free to stand in the present and to name the truth about our own lives and the world around us. Shame and fear do not, cannot silence us. It can't keep our excuses intact. But rather, we are given the courage to face the truth, to call a thing a thing. And from there, friends... There we take the next step, the next action toward justice and toward healing. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen.